September 13th, 2001. And uh, the first item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, we're going to move. Uh, through this agenda. Um, adjustments for this evening? Kevin. One, George, on the new business, would you please add the adoption of the past budget okay. for Road 203? We'll put that under uh, 12B. Um, and George, um, we decided under un unfinished business and new business at the policy meeting that those really are not going to be ready. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Do you want to wait till then, or? Uh, that, yeah, okay. we, we want to adjust the um, agenda. We'll just find out where they'll where they'll be next time. Um, approval of the October school board uh, minutes. I'm not seeing any concerns there, so we'll move on, um, and we will have uh, the report out from our high school representatives. Uh, a number of things have been going on at the high school uh, over the past month or so. Um, one thing that's actually coming up, uh, actually I guess I'll talk about what, what's happened. Um, the end of the first quarter uh, was November 2nd, and that passed without any problem. Um, you know, uh, report cards will be coming up the 16th. Um, and uh, early action uh, actually was due for seniors on uh, November the 1st, and so they should have all that stuff out uh, if they did already. Um, Um, most of the high school students are looking forward to the upcoming sports season, the winter season, uh, basketball, swimming, track. Um, all right, uh, we have a couple new things for the uh, high school environment. We have a uh, school lockdown, which is what some people call it. All the doors have been locked except for the main office and the receiving area. Um, the SAC voted on it and gave their um, recommendation to the administration uh, to lock all the doors. Also, uh, early detention. For those that are late in the morning, you know, if they get to school past 7.30, the next morning they have to serve detention. Um, it's working pretty well on uh, making kids come to school on time. <laughs> um, uh, just some other stuff. Uh, the, uh, the student council put on a haunted house for the, the Pond Cove uh, children's, uh, the, uh, the fall harvest, I think it's called. Uh, that, that went, out, went out, uh, off without a hitch. Um, we raised, uh, a good amount of money, um, I think $200, for um, a September 11th uh, charity. Um, we haven't decided which one yet, but uh, it's going to one of those, I think. Um, and as for upcoming events, uh, actually the blood drive is this Thursday, uh, the 15th, and I think it's running uh, throughout the school day. Uh, anybody who's interested, they don't have to be a high school student, uh, we, we welcome walk-ins. Um, and obviously, I think, although uh, September 11th, you know, the, the need for blood, uh, uh, related to September, September 11th has expired. I think it's underscored uh, how important it is. Um, uh, kind of like a civic duty almost, I guess. So we encourage anybody who's interested and able uh, to come in and give blood. And you can acquire at the health office uh, a list of requirements. Uh, can't have spent like six months in England or something like that. But uh, anyway, um, if you're interested, uh, definitely stop by and inquire at the, uh, the health office. And um, two more things. Uh, there's a big uh, Thanksgiving drive going on for food in the high school. Um, boxes in all the English rooms. Um, so we're trying to collect food for that. It's the nat Natural Helpers and Volunteer Club. And the next big thing is vacation. A week off for Thanksgiving. Uh. Yeah, okay. uh, thank you. Any uh, questions or comments for Chris or Dave? I think we're all set. Thanks. Good job. We'll There's hear two minutes us. in the penalty box for leaving off the hockey as a winter sport. That's all. <laughs> 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 Um, we'll now hear from our middle school reps. Hello, my name is Lily Hoffman. And I'm Brianna Bowman. And we are the reps from the middle school. Um, our school is participating in an event called the <coughs> Service Person Adoption Program. 
and this includes sending letters to courageous, brave, and dedicated service men and women who have and will continue to serve our nation in this time of need. The Student Council is also holding a food drive for the families that are not fortunate enough to have a hearty Thanksgiving dinner. And also on behalf of the student body, we would like to thank the Middle School Parents Association for hosting the annual book fair that will take place on December 5th. And other events in our school are the upcoming MEA tests, and they're going to start the week after we return from Thanksgiving break, and we're going to be tested, the first subject is language arts. And another event that just recently took place on November 7th was the sixth grade field trip to the play Alice Island, and this was aimed towards them learning theater etiquette and the history of the island. Um, another upcoming event is the math meet, and there is a 7th and 8th grade math team that will be participating and a 5th and 6th grade math club that is in training and will watch. And also later last week there was honors band and chorus tryouts and these were very successful and we're honored to say that CAPE continues to have many of the students accepted because the results were just recently in. So. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, questions for Lily or Brianna? No question, but a comment. I'm sure you know I get feedback from some of the uh, service men and women that you folks are writing to, mm -hmm. and they are all deeply, deeply appreciative. Um, it's kind of heartwarming for them to know that people back in Cape Elizabeth remember them and care about them. So keep those cards and letters going. Thank you. Thank, thank yeah. you. Was a <coughs> nice article in the paper about that. It was great. Right. Very nice. Um, we're going to move on to uh, communications. Do you have any schedule for this evening? No, just what you have in your pack, and one of those is the copy of that article that has been referred to regarding um, Bill Nemitz's column and soldiers link to those back home. Yep. Very nice. Um, comments from the public? We'd invite at this time. Seeing none, I'm going to move on um, to recognition, and my understanding is that uh, we had some recognition scheduled, but we're going to postpone that? Postpone that to the next meeting. Um, which brings us to the superintendent's report. Just a quick update on um, two issues. One is the Education Foundation. The Foundation uh, Board will be meeting on November 28th at 7 p.m. Uh, right now they are in, in the process of interviewing firms or individuals that will be involved with helping the group uh, forge ahead with a capital campaign. Um, things are moving quite nicely and they, their goal still is to create um, an amount uh, in, in terms of seed money to get that process off the ground. Um, future direction planning, uh, a major initiative uh, on one of our workshop days on November 19th. Um, there will be a curriculum focus and the entire staff will be going through a process of curriculum mapping. Uh, Sarah Simmons will, will head that up um, and uh, hopefully this will be something that we can continue to have a discussion with some of the results with the school board maybe at a at a future workshop. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, we're going to move on to uh, principal's reports. We'll start uh, with Jeff at the high school. I am actually uh, creatively ceding my time to Dr. Michael Efren and a group of his physics students to talk about a recent star party. So, Dr. Efren. <coughs> Actually, I don't remember the date. <laughs> it must have been about three weeks ago. We brought 80 people down to a star party. Now, what a star party is, uh, you have the date? What? <laughs> um, there is, a, there is uh, an organization in uh, southern Maine called the Astronomical Society of Northern New England. And it's made up of uh, a group of people who basically have astronomy as a hobby. They raised money, uh, I think a lot of contributions from the members of this organization themselves, and they just built an observatory uh, in Kennebunk. And... <clears throat> It opened in September, 
and they have two rather large telescopes inside a building that has a retractable roof. And when they throw these star parties, they have one public star party a month, uh, one Friday a month, where, where you can bring your kids and your family and go down and look at the night sky through their telescopes. And what they do is they have other members of their club come down. And there were about seven telescopes set up, including the two big ones in the building when we went down. The 80 folks who went down included 59 physics students, 21 family members, and uh, Mr. Curtis and myself. Uh, and the students were all from our physics classes. And uh, we have some of the students who went, and they're going to tell you about two or so minutes worth of some of the things they saw in the night sky during that star party. And we'll start with uh, Taylor. Anyways, um, this, is a, this is a map of uh, the solar system uh, uh, 37 Ursae Majoris, which is in Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. Um, it was recently discovered and, uh, well, the star wasn't discovered, but the solar system was, uh, they discovered that it actually had uh, two um, Jupiter-sized planets orbiting around it. and. Uh, what was so great about this is that um, up until this point, the majority of the stars that they'd found were um, uh, orbiting, well, they had eccentric orbits. They were not very round, and they, um, which means that they'd go really close to the sun and then really far away from it. Thus, they'd be totally unable to sustain life. And even, even though this, you know, they're very large uh, gaseous planets, they'd still, you know, there's still more regular orbits, um, more similar to our own. And the picture you have is actually um, a comparison of this solar system compared to our own. Um, there's, uh, well, a great similarity. It's, it's basically in between uh, Mars and Jupiter in our uh, solar system is where the two large planets would be going around. So anyways, so the, um, basically the, uh, this is a, a big thing. Um, but they probably won't be finding smaller planets because the, uh, they're using a, a device or a, a technique called the, the Doppler shift, and it's only really good for finding larger planets. So, but this is really good. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Questions? Guess not. <laughs> Thanks. That was Taylor Donahue. And uh, we'll stay with planets. Uh, Jen Campbell. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. The topic I chose to do was Uranus, which happened to be one of the most distant things we saw in the night sky that night. Um, I chose it because even though it is so far away, being 14.5 times larger than Earth and almost a billion miles away, um, even though it was very small up in one of the more powerful telescopes, you could still see it maybe about two inches big and you could actually see the glowing blue color from Uranus's gases. Um, known as a gas planet, it actually has a solid core. And what I find most fascinating about Uranus is that it's tilted on its side at a 98 degree angle, and its rings spin up and down horizontally mm. instead of around the planet like Saturn and Jupiter. 
Um, it has 10 rings all together, which is a lot less than Saturn, but more than Jupiter. Um, 18 moons surround it. Its most famous moon is called Ariel. And Ariel is known as a valley crater moon, which means that it's a solid mass. And it's one of the most famous moons because the Voyager 2 has taken many, many pictures of it. And it's led us to discover a lot of things about the gas planets and about how ungaseous they really are. Um, it was discovered by William Herschel. And most people think that Neptune is the third largest planet, but in fact, Uranus is. Great. Questions? Um, I, Jen, you said it was in the telescope and you're looking at it, it's two inches in diameter? Mm -hmm. Like if you look in the telescope, Holy like the range your eyes see, even though it's so far away, you can actually see a good portion of it, maybe almost that big. Wow. And you can still see the bluish glow from it. It's known for being like really, really bright turquoise blue. What's the power of the telescope? <laughs> which, which, tel which scope was this? In the building? Yeah. <coughs> I don't remember exactly, probably around 500 times, something like that. So it was a very big uh, refracting telescope. About so so in diameter. Um, let's stay with the planets. Uh, Alan. Hi, um, I'm Alan. I'm also uh, just for your information. I'm the uh, SAC chairman, so it's nice for me to get here and meet all of you. Um, I, talking about Mars, uh, I'm sure you know a little bit about Mars. It's the fourth planet from the sun. Um, it's referred to as the red planet because it appears to look red, although really uh, NASA photographs really show that it's more of a tan color. Um, it's about 6,794 kilometers in uh, diameter, which is quite a bit smaller than Earth, but uh, their days are just about as long at 24 hours, 37 minutes. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, but their years are about twice as long. Uh, Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Uh, they both are irregularly shaped and pitted with craters. They look more like you know, weird shaped asteroids or something. Uh, and uh, Deimos orbits Mars about once every 31 hours, and the other one, uh, Phobos, spends uh, it speeds around it about three times a day, actually. Um, <coughs> there's been a, a lot of controversy about Mars, whether it uh, has life or not, but uh, I know we really didn't see any. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty far away. Um, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much a good uh, summary of Mars. Uh, I'm also up here speaking on behalf of the uh, barbecue team that went to the uh, star party. Um, I'm co-captain along with uh, Kevin back there and uh, Josh Safer. Uh, and we brought two big gas grills and uh, we had a nice, oh wait, no, we, we brought two gas grills and a charcoal grill. And we had a nice big barbecue going. Uh, we had some uh, hamburgers, some hot dogs, some, uh, I think we had some kielbasa, some, uh, perhaps some chicken, I'm not really sure. Um, and we managed to feed pretty much everyone, which was great. Um, I actually spent a lot of the time cooking, so I didn't get to see as many things as everyone <laughs> else. But, but it was it was fun, anyways. It was great, um, and we had a lot of fun being able to cook for everyone, and you know, it was pretty successful. So, any questions? So you actually may have missed the the signs of life on Mars right. while you were while I was cooking, yeah. right. while I was cooking burgers. My eyes were all my eyes were all teared up, you know from the smoke. The smoke's rough, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Elizabeth Smith was also going to uh, present here tonight, but she's homesick. Um, Camille. This is Camille Earnshaw. Is there, a, is there a quiz after this? 
Yeah, <laughs> scary. Thanks. Um, this picture is a picture of a globular star cluster. And the definition is of a globular star cluster is a compact sphere, spherical, spherical group of stars containing many thousands or even millions of stars. And this was one of my favorite things to see. I, this was at the first telescope, and these telescopes are like this big. And the, the people up there knew so much about it. And they were saying, there's, I guess there's lots of different kinds of these star clusters, and one of these kinds is a globular star cluster. And um, the diameters of these clusters average for about from about 50 to 60 light years. And the stars within the cluster are very densely packed, so that's what gives them the globular shape, and hence the name. And there are about 200 globular clusters in the Milky Way, that's our galaxy. And I guess they have lots of different orbits. And a researcher, um, Harlow Shapley of Harvard University, he located the center of the Milky Way in 1918 by studying the orbits of these globular star clusters. And it was just like, there were so many different things at the, at the star party. It was just amazing to see. I'm really glad that I got to go. Thank you. Neil? Neil? Because it's, if you were just to look at that in the night sky without a telescope, would it look like one star? Yeah. Yeah, that's what they said. And these, I don't know how, how many times these, mag, like these telescopes are magnifying it, but I guess that was a pretty good picture of it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <laughs> these, these globular clusters are actually some of the oldest stars in our galaxy, and they orbit the center of the, our galaxy is an elliptical galaxy, so it's kind of in one plane. Mm -hmm. These globular clusters actually orbit the center of the galaxy uh, in a plane perpendicular to the plane of the rest of the galaxy. Why is that? Do they know? No that? one knows. Um, or at least we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Life on Mars knows. Um, Kevin. <laughs> this is Kevin Sessa. The Veil Nebula is actually a, a supernova remnant, so it's kind of just pieces of an explosion, basically a star explosion. And um, it's actually really, really, really huge, but it's really hard to see because it's kind of, if you look at the black and white picture, it's a lot harder to see. It's a lot faded. And it was really hard to see when we went there. He uh, kind of had a, gave us reference of like 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock, and you could barely see this fuzz kind of go by, and for a second I saw it and it was going. Mm. But it was just, it's interesting to see how huge it is, and it's just, its full name is like, you know, uh, Saigus Loop or something like that. But uh, it's really, it's cool to just uh, think about how huge this is, because the space between each, each piece of that is millions of light years apart, and just to fathom the distance of like a light year is incredible. Plus, that's 10 million light years away from us, and that's huge distances. And I just think it's cool to look at that. That was the fun part about the trip was just to look at the stars and just think about the space between one star to the next and how far away it is from us. And that's what I enjoyed about it. That's great. Any questions? Questions? Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Amanda Gann. So what you're looking at is the ring nebula, and um, that's one of the most studied and um, most well-known nebulae in the sky. Um, it was very impressive when we saw it. It's, yeah, so there it is. <laughs> um, Just realized that we were the only ones looking at this stuff. It's really oh. actually pretty neat. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it was discovered 200 years ago by a French astronomer, and it's been widely studied because it's um, incredibly unique. Um, it's oh, about 2,000 light years away from Earth, so that means that when we saw it, about 2,000 years before that, the, the light was actually leaving the nebula. So if you think about kind of the beginning of uh, year zero and that thing was shooting out its light, mm. um, it's got a diameter of about one light year. Um, so it's fairly compact compared to the Veil Nebula that Kevin just talked about. And it's for that reason that um, it's been so studied. And what it is, is it's the gases given off by a dying star. So um, as the star is getting smaller and smaller, it's giving off um, different gases. And if you look on um, the color picture, if you have one, um, it, it doesn't actually look like that when we see it in the sky. It's not all beautifully colored like that. But that's been um, added by Hubble to sort of describe the different layers of gases that the star gives off. And so the blue is the emission from the extremely hot helium. So that's um, closest to the center where the star is actually um, dying and becoming a dwarf star. So that's the hottest. And then we've got the green, which is oxygen, it's ionized oxygen. And um, the red is ionized nitrogen. And so um, each one is a little bit cooler. Um, as it as it gets farther and farther from the center of the star, and the uh, the center is quite hot. It has a surface temperature of um, 120,000 degrees Celsius, so um, it's fairly impressive. <laughs> and um, yeah, there were so many amazing things, and that um, definitely stood out because it is so compact, and we were able to see it quite well. So, thank Dr. Efron for giving us the opportunity. Terrific, thanks. <coughs> So then, lastly, um, this, this was an opportunity for all the physics students to go and have an experience uh, looking at the night sky through good telescopes. Um, what comes next is, a, is an opportunity to do a research project in astronomy in depth. Uh, there's another uh, observatory in Pownall, Maine, which is about a 40, 45 minute drive north. And uh, it's called the Blueberry Pond Observatory. Uh, it's run by a man named Thurston Searfoss. And Thurston uh, is providing us the opportunity to go up to his observatory and do research with him. A number of, uh, a, a lot of students are interested uh, we're going to follow up on this first experience by having getting involved, kids involved with uh, a major kind of research project, which will probably involve up to six to eight hours on the, on the telescope up there collecting data. And we could always come back and report on that when that's... <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. Michael. Thank you, Michael. If, if you want to know when you were there, you were there on October 10th. And the only reason I know is because those of us who were on the building committee had a conversation about That's you. That's right. And we were all jealous that he was at a star party and we were at a building committee meeting. Thank it was you. October 10th. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Thank you for uh, sharing with us. On, on behalf of the board, uh, thank you all for coming uh, to visit. Um, the uh, board members are always excited to learn new things, um, but we're uh, even more excited um, to see 
how excited you are about learning new things. And, uh, and it looks like this was a, a great success. So thanks for uh, visiting. And if there's some neat stuff that you do in terms of research, um, come back and um, share it with us. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. That was um, that was good, and and um, I don't want to make anyone feel badly, but that was probably one of the more entertaining um, principals' reports that we've had, and everybody was paying attention. The presentation was really out there. <laughs> <laughs> we were tested on how much we've actually retained. That might be something. Uh, we're going to move on to the middle school. A hard act to follow, Nancy. <laughs> well, I realize right up front I'm not going to be anywhere near as entertaining or exciting as that, but um, lots of credit to my colleague Jeff Shedd, who in a short time has already laid a new groundwork for creativity in principles reports. Um, and Mr. Shedd, I just want you to know that Mr. Eismeyer and myself are up to the challenge. <laughs> 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 um, next month, we'll probably be singing and dancing the middle school report, so just be prepared. Um, but I agree with um, what you said, George. It was really exciting to watch young learners be excited about what they're learning. That's great. And in a feeble attempt to make an, a segue from that to the topic we all agreed we would be talking upon tonight, um, I'm going to share just two classroom visits with you real quickly before I talk about that topic. Um, today, I had a chance to go into Jill Bell's classroom, and Jill, as you remember, went on sabbatical last year, and her work was to bring technology and new technology learning ways to use technology into the classroom. She was particularly energized around the study of using video conferencing and what that would entail. She made connections with the New York Institute of Technology. We have a camera on loan for them that is very expensive. Um, and we've been working with them. And she's been working to make connections. We also have a, par a business partner in this enterprise, Verizon. And today, Peter Riley, representing Verizon, was in the classroom as well. And we had our first connection with the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo um, topic itself is not particularly part of the fifth grade curriculum. However, this was our chance to really kind of learn and make sure all these connections would work. There were a few glitches in connections, so it was a real learning exercise. However, today in that fifth grade classroom, I learned about plantigrades, digigrades, and angula grades. But I'm sure you all know what those are, so. Um, <laughs> they are. The, the first of the plantigrades are flat footed animals, um, and the digigrades are toe runners, um, like fox and kangaroos. And then the angula grades are the hooved animals, like horses. And it was really great because the person could talk with the students, they participated. She had them stand up and move and look at different things. So it wasn't just talking back and forth, we were moving. She had some animals from the Bronx Zoo there to show as examples, as well as pictures of things that they might know, like prairie dogs and things like that. But we saw a monitor lizard, um, which was really quite interesting to watch. And the fox that she shared with us is a fox that lives in the savanna in Africa. So um, it was a great connection, and we'll continue on that learning experience, but that was exciting to be a part of. Last week, I had a chance to go into Cheryl Higgins' fifth grade classroom, and Cheryl, during the summer, had devoted much of her summer work to really exploring the challenge of how young people come to learn how to comprehend in depth. And she'd been really working with two books, The Mosaic of Thought and also Strategies at Work. And she and I have shared many conversations. We'd like to have more than we have an opportunity for, but many um, conversations around comprehension and literacy. And she invited me into her class. They have just finished reading a novel, Two Old Women, which is an Ameri a Native American um, legend and story. And the students were using a technique with questions, predictions, and connections. And as they read, 
What they do is on post-its, they write their questions, predictions, and connections. And then one of the groups was gracious enough to let me sit with them while they shared all of these great things, um, decided what they were, helped each other clarify them for a bit. But the, the process isn't to answer the questions at that time. Then they go up and they post them on a board. And then as a class, they begin to have a more in-depth conversation about what they've been reading. And as I was talking with the three young fifth graders that I had an opportunity to sit with, I asked them to explain to me what the activity was like. And they said, well, you know, it's like when we read and you have to read real carefully, but they said, really, the big thing is you have to read and you have to think at the same time in order to do this activity. And um, for me, that is simply said exactly what the activity does focus on, is making sure that young people realize and all readers realize that reading is a reading and a thinking activity at the same time. So, if I'd only thought, Jeff, to bring them here and to share that instead of me telling, it would have been great, but I'll save that for another time. <clears throat> the other thing that uh, we had said we might talk about tonight is really to just bring you up to date with our programs that we use for um, instructional strategies and supports um, are things. Um, as you know, in the middle school, we do have this year a full-time teacher working in what we call our ISP program, just our instructional support program. It works uh, when the guidance of our student assistance team, the SAT, a program you have supported over the last several years. And just to let you know that this year in the program right now, we have 12 students who are working in the instructional support program. Many more students are served by the student assistance team. And that team meets weekly. Uh, they talk about a student is on the topic table for each time. The classroom teachers are invited <coughs> to come who have that student. The parents, the student, if they wish, rarely the student attends it at this particular point, though, but the student is invited. And they really talk about strategies and ways to help that student learn better and to do things. And it's a great um, brainstorming activity. From that SAT meeting, some of the students will also be recommended to become part of the ISP program, where we do focus on instruction in literacy and numeracy, language arts and mathematics. In the morning, the teacher focuses helping students in grades seven and eight, and in the afternoon, we focus on working with students in grades five and six. In the classroom, when you walk into that instructional support classroom, you'll find an atmosphere of, first of all, great respect and caring. And these are some of our students who out in the re their regular classes would be some of the quieter voices, the people who would be doing things to make sure they didn't get called on for the answer to anything in great depth. If I got called upon, it might be to speak to me about my inattentiveness or something like that, but I don't want anyone quizzing me on some of the things I might have studied the night before. However, in this class, that doesn't happen because the class is small, you can't hide, everybody participates, and the times that I've had a chance to be in there this year, you really watch everybody doing their best work for that day, really trying. So as we focus on literacy and numeracy, we're also building up self-esteem and respect and understanding that our best work is our best work. Whatever that is, that's what we need to share and learn with others, and we need to feel confident in sharing what our best work is. So it's been a program that we feel has really helped a whole portion of our student body. We think it's important to continue, and it is one of those classrooms where you walk into and you can see the students know that there's a real close relationship with the teacher in that program, there's a close relationship to one another, and most importantly, there's a real responsibility to themselves to learn and to do the best that they can. Thank you. That's great, Nancy. Thanks. Questions? Okay. Tom? Von Cove? Good evening. I guess beyond pretending you already haven't heard about other galaxies in the Bronx Zoo, um, there's no graceful way out of this. But <laughs> I did, want, like Nancy, wanted to bring you up to date and where we stand with the instructional support team because it's been a topic of conversation, particularly at, uh, at budget time. You probably recall that I, I consider the heart of the instructional support our teacher assistance team, which is made up of the Carmen Melito and myself, assistant principal, the principal, guidance counselor, the reading teachers, the um, social worker, and a teacher or a parent who would like to bring a child to this team's attention, either because the child is not doing quite as well as expected or in some cases doing a little too well, uh, particularly in math. 
The team meets once a week before school. We usually uh, talk about two kids a week. And the atmosphere, although informal, is really focused on professional sharing. It gives the, it's a little different from the uh, middle school and high school model because the teachers in the elementary school spend all day with the kids and uh, teach all subjects. So the team listens uh, quietly and attentively. We attempt to draw out the teacher to see what the concerns are. And I must say that teachers come uh, completely prepared to these meetings, having checked previous records and talked to uh, students, previous teachers if necessary. We offer tips and support, and sometimes that's enough. Um, the teacher would say, I haven't thought of that. Maybe I'll try that. Thank you. Um, it's been nice talking to you. But because we have added another position, the instructional support teacher, we're also able to offer direct instructional support, either in small group or individually, mostly in math. And last year, the instructional support teacher saw 30 kids um, for various amounts of time some starting in October throughout the year, some for uh, shorter periods for a month or two. The other advantage of having this forum is the, the reading teachers, because we expanded that position two years ago, get to get a, a, a feel for what's going on for instruction in reading and in writing throughout the school. Nancy mentioned the emphasis on uh, comprehension in the class she visited last week. We did the same in Pond Cove with uh, Reading teachers attending TATs and going to team meetings are able to um, assist the teachers and, pr and provide um, some modeling occasionally. After a year of concentrating on comprehension in, gr in grades really K through four, there's not as much demand for their serv the services of the reading teachers to teach that skill. All the scores, by the way, we've measured them in grade three and four have gone up. So the reading teachers have been able to look at uh, different um, areas of need. It might be, uh, I think it's word work this year. And we were able to put more attention to the grade levels that need it, which in this case might be introductory literacy in kindergarten. So that's worked out really well. And because we don't operate on a categorical model the way special education does, we, our meetings are more informal and the sharing of information frequently leads to professional development activities. We try to generalize what we do, see trends here and there, and then give feedback about, about some of the curriculum, including the level of difficulty of our uh, Chicago math program, which you know is not the traditional ones, and some kids have a hard time with that. Um, the relationships through teacher assistance at, um, a team ha have improved, improved our relationships with special education uh, dramatically. We're able to share information much more easily, and I feel uh, fully embrace all these kids and not worry about which category they fall into. I talked to Claire, to Claire briefly about, before I spoke tonight, and she wholeheartedly endorses this, and if you, you're welcome to say a, a word or two if you'd like. You don't have to. I mean, we, we, I don't want to put you on the spot. One thing I was telling Tom is that we've noticed when a student gets referred to for special ed testing that there has been more documentations of the different types of modifications and accommodations that had been tried and the results of those. So what it does in essence is it makes uh, the evaluators know more what particular instruments that they should select to do testing. So overall I think it's improved that overall process that we're doing. That's where we stand with that. And I guess I will, this is unrelated to instructional support, add one more slightly exotic thing. We got a grant from the Maine Math and Science Association this year to follow up on a workshop that Tom and Nancy and I attended last spring to do an uh, American version of Japanese lesson study. We are, we've already spent about 10 hours, eight or 10 of us, studying one particular lesson in fourth grade math. Uh, we're, wondering why we do it that way, what the next step will be. We've talked to some fifth grade teachers about it. And this week, we're going to watch the lesson take place, tape it, and then debrief it. Um, from what I can tell, it's not the lesson itself. It's having eight or 10 people in one room talking about the lesson and the whole process of the uh, math development K through 12. It's a very exciting project. And if Jeff is challenging, to bring, challenging us to bring students, then we might do that for the lesson study. Questions? Questions for Tom? I just wanted to mention that the, that 
the whole concept of the looking at instruction and, uh, and supporting the, our whole notion that all students can learn, I think, at the middle school and, and at Pond Cove, what you heard in the reports tonight uh, really emphasized that. I think this Jap Japanese lesson study is just an example of how we're really focusing in on instruction. I think uh, in each school does it in a different way, but uh, I know when Nancy and I and, and, and Tom went to that workshop, uh, it was intriguing, and yeah. we all liked what we saw, but it does take a lot of time and does really focus in on one particular lesson and the instruction that takes place. It's an exciting concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very intense, but it looks like it'd be very rewarding. Great. Thanks, Tom. We're going to move on to our committee reports, and we'll start with uh, this evening's finance subcommittee. Uh, Kevin. Well, we had an exciting finance committee meeting tonight. Um, we reviewed the past budget, um, and I'll go over that very, very briefly for everyone. Um, we pay a tuition to, uh, to send our students there that's up slightly, and that's... Uh, going to be $77,000 over which we really have no control, but that tuition provides opportunities that we cannot afford to begin to provide at the home school. Um, and it's been the consensus of the board for as long as I've been on the board that this is some of the best spent money that we, uh, that we have. Uh, additionally, um, there is a part two budget which funds new equipment and new um, new programs at PASS, and um, although I'll be presenting a motion on that later, the total on that is about $7,100, which is our portion. Uh, there are nine other schools that are sending students to PASS. The exciting piece of this new budget is that we will be establishing, if all the other school boards uh, do the same, uh, we will be establishing a biotechnology program come this September, which will be a dramatic turning point in changing the perception of PASS as a place to send your less than desirable student and underachieving student to the reality of what PASS really is, which is an alternative, different type of education not readily available in the typical high school that can and does lead to fairly well-paying jobs in the state of Maine. Um, so I will be presenting that later. That's the end of my editorial. Uh, most, most of the, uh, the rest of uh, the meeting was devoted to our typical housekeeping duties of reviewing warrants and signing the warrants and reviewing appropriation reports. We also had the opportunity to review the annual financial report, which is a public document should anybody care to see it. And I'd like to congratulate Pauline and the entire central office staff for their, uh, what apparently is some very astounding successful work this year. Uh, there was only one management comment that, uh, uh, that appears in, I think, probably every management comment letter that is mailed to every company in the world. Um, so uh, I'm pretty pleased with that. And I think the town, the town side is, uh, pretty pleased with the work that was done there. Um, we reviewed energy conservation reports and projects. Uh, we are uh, making progress in terms of uh, more effectively spending our energy dollars. And that's pretty much it. We reviewed an agenda for a workshop that will be taking place this Thursday evening with the, uh, with the town council. And that is it. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we're going to move on to the policy subcommittee report. Jennifer. Um, policy met. Um, you, might, you might need to pull your mic down. There you go. Policy committee met last Wednesday afternoon, and um, we reviewed uh, the special education, new special education policies, which had a first reading last month, um, which are under unfinished and new business. But we've decided to. We had some questions for council, and so we've decided to wait another month on those. Okay. And your next meeting is? Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. It's uh, the first Wednesday of the month, which is December 5th at noon in the Jordan Conference Room. Great. Thanks. Um, 
the building committee? Um, Marie. Since our last building committee uh, meeting, we have um, had interviews with five architecture firms, and um, the committee did site visits and visited actual um, uh, structures that these people have done in schools, elementary schools, middle schools, and renovation work. We are now in the process of negotiating a contract with the firm that we picked. Hopefully, we will have that done within the next week or so. And, um, and actually, this was a unanimous decision by our committee to choose the firm that we did. And our next meeting will be November 29th um, at 7 p.m. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, we're going to move on to unfinished business. Um, and I believe that this was to be consideration for of policies for a second reading. And but Jennifer, you're saying these are we, these are going to push be pushed off for another month because right. we've already gone through the first reading of these. Um, and uh, you have a couple of uh, policies for first reading uh, under well, new business. We're, right. Are you we're, setting those aside also? Right. Okay. Um, then under new business, it's uh, the um, consideration of the superintendent's recommendation to co-curricular fee positions. Um, and I guess um, these are the uh, athletic fee positions for the winter. 2001-2002. Yeah, we have also we have co-curricular fee positions. You have in front of you a list of co-curricular positions at the high school and at the middle school, um, including instrumental music, uh, mentors, uh, choral music, and instrumental music also at the middle school. Okay, we need a um, a motion, Kevin. I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for co-curricular positions as enumerated. Thank you. Comments or questions? Oh, uh, second, I mean. <laughs> Susan, thanks. Comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. We also have a uh, recommendation for uh, the following new coaching, new high school coaching positions. Uh, Ann Hegelin, the assistant Nordic skiing, um, and returning high school coaches, uh, Jeremy LaRose, assistant indoor track, Mark Joyce, assistant indoor track, Nick Garrett, assistant indoor track, and a returning middle school coach, Laura Cregan, Nordic Ski. Okay, we need a motion on these um, athletic fee positions, Jim. I would move that we confirm the superintendent's recommendations to athletic fee positions for the winter season. Okay, need a second. Jennifer, thanks. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. Um, we also, uh, is, that's, you're all set. Uh, we also have um, the, the PATHS 2002-2003 uh, budget. Kevin. Before I make this motion, there was one important piece I left out, and that is on the part co one cost of $77,000 that's subject to reimbursement by uh, the state. Uh, to what extent, we don't know. We'll see when uh, they take care of business at the legislature again. But we do not pay the full freight on that part one cost. And now I now move that the Cape Elizabeth School Board adopt and commit to the um, uh, 2000 to 2003 uh, part one and part two budget for Portland Arts and Technical High School uh, respectively 77,038.99 for part one and 7,085.26 for part two. Okay, thanks. We need a second on that motion. Marie, um, comments or questions? I think it is maybe important to just share that um, there was a bit of excitement on the part of the board in terms of the new biotechnology um, area of study that will be introduced at PATHS. Um, I, I think we're all sort of interested in seeing the number of very, it appear to be, I don't think there's very many big businesses, but there appear to be a, certainly a, 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 a significant and growing number of small enterprises that are connected um, to biotechnology. 
um, it's, it's very exciting just to, uh, to see um, those businesses emerging, and it's very exciting to uh, see um, the uh, uh, PATHS uh, uh, program uh, initiate some activity and, and uh, offer that as an opportunity for students. It's, um, it's, um, it's great, and I think that uh, that was pretty much the consensus of the board. Um, any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seven zero. And um, thank you. On behalf of Pass, <laughs> I I do have more than one hat. So. Um, <coughs> before we uh, entertain a motion uh, to adjourn our public session and go into executive session, for the purpose of discussing uh, negotiations. Um, I do want to review some dates to remember. Um, Marie referenced a building committee meeting which will um, happen. Mm -mm. That date's wrong. Yeah. What, it what was, was the 29th. The 29th. So, it and was the, just changed. And what, what day is that, Marie? Um, is it's that all? a Thursday. Okay, so that's Thursday, November 29th, still at 7 p.m. at the, com at the uh, Jordan Conference Room. Yes. Um, there is a school board workshop that's coming up on Tuesday, November 27th um, at the high school library, 7 p.m. Um, the focus of that looks uh, like it will probably uh, be on uh, the curriculum mapping that's, um, that's happening. It's sort of interesting for people uh, to hear about that and for the board to hear about that. Policy subcommittee meeting, as Jennifer said, Wednesday, December 5th. Uh, 2001 at noontime in the Jordan Conference Room, um, and then we have our Finance Subcommittee meeting at 6.30 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room on December 11th, 2001, which is the next formal meeting of the board, followed by the regular school board meeting in the council chambers at 7.30 p.m. I need now a uh, motion to adjourn our public session, and we don't have any intentions of coming back into public session to enter executive session uh, for the purpose of discussing negoci negotiations. So moved. Thank you, Kevin. Second. Blaine, thank you. Um, questions, comments, seeing none. All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>